Having flown to a lot of the major airports around the world, I can tell you that Chicago has some of the fastest talking controllers. It is a very fast moving airport. And if you don't pay attention to what the controllers are telling you, even though they rarely make mistakes, they might tell you to taxi somewhere where your plane doesn't fit. And then you drive your $400 million aircraft into a pole. Here's what happened. All right, sorry, 67 X ray turn, left on Kilo, Bravo, Bravo, then the immediate left turn. And then I want you to go to Zulu, hold short runway 9, right? Bravo, Bravo, then Bravo, Bravo 2. Bravo, 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 Bravo 2. That's how it is, 6, 7, X ray. Uh, Bravo, that's how it is, 6, 7, X ray. Yeah. Uh, I think we need a pole to the right. Even though that's not really funny that they hit a pole, I just, I just like the way that he said it. Uh, I think we need a pole to the right. There's a term that's used sometimes in aviation, but it really applies to everywhere in the world, and that is trust but verify. We trust our controllers that what they're telling us to do is the best thing, but we also verify it. Like when I'm flying through uh, a weather storm or something like that, the controllers will say, okay, turn to this heading. We're gonna cut you through all the big thunder cells as they're trying to get you into the airport. So you trust them, but you also don't just not have your weather radar up. You have your weather radar up so you can see exactly what they're doing. So you have to trust them that they're gonna do it. And I'll tell you, like right now I'm in Miami. Miami has some of the best controllers when it comes to vectoring you around some very bad thunderstorms. They do an amazing job. But that doesn't mean I don't, I just turn my weather radar off. No, I, I watch what they're sending me because they may be seeing something or I may see something that they don't see. At the end of the day, I'm on the plane, not them. So here's what happens. When you get to a given airport, you get this huge pack of information. And if there's one thing I'd love to see the FAA ever change, it would be changing that pack of information to make it more easily readable. Because at a large airport, you could have 30 or 40 minutes of reading to get through it in order to know where you can and cannot take your plane, where there's construction, where the lights are at, all this stuff. And it's hard to decipher what in there is what you need and what in there is not really helpful or useful to you at all. So this big pack of information, you should read it. And, and a lot of pilots do read through it, but it's easy to miss it because it's not really built for a human to read it. It's just like this uh, computer generated code, like this time from this time on a, on a Zulu time, which is the time that we use. It's a, it's a scheduled time that works everywhere around the world. So from this time to this time, this taxiway, you can't go in there because they're doing construction between these dates. So now you're like, okay, what date, what time, when will I be there? It's just, it's very hard to break through there. So they know that pilots will be negligent sometimes in reading that, so they came up with a different solution for us. This is Chicago, and for some reason, when I became an airline pilot, I hit all the big complex airports, and this is one of them. As you can see, there's a lot of different taxiways here, but the incident that we're talking about took place right over here. The controller wanted the pilots to go Kilo, Bravo, 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 Bravo 2, Zulu, and then hold short of 9 right. Now that seems like a lot of instruction to be given, and unfortunately, that's just the way things go, and that's why there's two pilots up there. So you have one pilot who's taxiing the aircraft, looking outside, and the other pilot who's writing everything down. And we develop a shorthand. So for example, I'll write K, B, 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 2, Z, and then throw a line, and then 9 R. So that lets me know, okay, these are the taxiways instructions that we're gonna use, and then for me, the slash means hold short of the thing that comes behind it. That's the way I do it. Everybody, every pilot has their own different way of doing it. Now I'm very fortunate because not every airline pilot has access to these charts, but you're gonna notice something and that's this little section right here, which is red. What that tells me as a pilot is that I cannot take my aircraft, which has a wingspan of 213 feet through this area. It doesn't tell me what's there or why I can't go through there. It just says, for the wingspan of my aircraft, 213 feet, because the aircraft that I'm using in this particular chart is a regular 747-400. A Dash 8 has a larger wingspan, but on a regular 747-400, 213 feet is how big my wingspan is. So it says right there, you can't bring a plane with that wingspan through that area. So then why would a controller send a plane into this area where it could hit something? Well, this is the same chart, but I changed the chart to tell them that I was taxiing a 737. And as you can see, there is no restriction now to move through this area. 
Now these charts, like I showed you, are constantly being updated. So as things happen, they update that information to the manufacturer of the chart and then it gets updated and we have access to it. But even if it doesn't get updated and we don't have access to it, we still have the responsibility as we're taxing. For example, last night when we were taxing in, there was a, a plane that was kind of on the line as, as I was actually taxing the plane. So I'm looking at the right hand window to make sure while I'm taxing that I'm not gonna hit anything over there. We always have the responsibility at the end of the day to make sure that we don't hit something, whether it's supposed to be there or not supposed to be there. So to have something like this happen, they had a few options. One, I'm guessing it was in that big pack of information that is not easy to read, which is why I think the FAA should change that. Uh, two, I don't know if they have access to the charts the way that I do with the red thing, but that red thing would obviously save you a lot of money if you ran an airline to not have a pilot go through that area. But again, it could happen. You could have been on a, a different chart or something else and not noticed it. So that is a possibility. But as you can see, it didn't just hit the very tip of the wing. It was pretty deep in there. So they really never had a chance to make it past that pole. Unfortunately, as pilots from the very first time we start in flight school, one of the things that we do is air traffic controllers are telling us to do things and then we do them. Hey, you're clear for takeoff. You can take off. You're clear to land. You can land. Turn left, turn right, climb, descend. All those instructions are things that we're getting told all the time. And a lot of times we take for granted that these people are going to safely move us around. Now I've told you before, there are times where controllers make mistakes and especially while we're flying, there are things in there to prevent us from having things happen like climbing into another plane or descending into another plane or going into a mountain. There are things that are set up on the aircraft that if the controller does make a mistake that we don't get ourselves or everybody on our plane in trouble or killed. However, on the ground, there's no such thing. If they're gonna taxi you into a pole, if you're not going to look at your charts, look out your window, uh, look at the report of all the things that could be broken or changed on the airport, if you're not gonna do those things, then you're gonna have something like this happen. And unfortunately, that's just one of the responsibilities about being a pilot when you get given a $400 million aircraft, they expect you to do the other things, also to look out the window. For something like this, at some airlines, you're gonna lose your job because this isn't a cheap fix. A special team is going to have to get flown out to look at this and then fix it because you can see they weren't just tapping the pole, the pole really dug into the wing. And when they send this special team out, you know it's gonna be crazy expensive because aviation stuff is already very expensive. So when it's something special, it's gonna be wildly expensive. Unfortunately, that's part about being a pilot. You get some of the glory, but you also have the responsibilities of things like this. And when it goes wrong, you end up at your chief pilot and then your chief pilot is looking at you going, how in the world do you take a plane and then taxi it into a pole when it's clear out? Maybe if the visibility was bad, maybe, but clear day? Seems a bit weird. 41, turn left heading 070, traffic 11 o'clock on a mile, MD 80 at 6,000, maintain five. 85,000 left 070, traffic inside. We'll keep the visual 141. Thank you, 141. Maintain visual separation from the MD80. Caution, wait turbulence. And climb and maintain 14,000. Keep the visual on the MD80 and climb and maintain 14,000. Thank you, 141. American 818, the Learjet has you in sight and they're going to maintain visual. Climb through your altitude, turning north. 818, we see you. Now this type of clearance is not a clearance that they that I hear controllers give anymore in the US. And Europe has something, and actually South America does this too, and it's something I think is a really stupid clearance, and that is line up and wait behind landing traffic. I, I hate it, I think it's a terrible clearance to give because you could have somebody here line up and wait and they don't hear the landing traffic part. I, I just think it's very dumb. But this is the part I want to talk about right here. Thank you. This puts all the responsibility on the pilot that's in the Lear aircraft to stay away from that MD-80, that American aircraft. So it's putting all the responsibility on him or her to stay away and see the other aircraft and stay away from them. I don't really like that. I don't like that as being the other pilot in the MD-80. I don't really like that being in the Lear, uh, even though I would prefer that because then at least I'm in control of seeing what's going on and how far I w stay away from them. But I, I just think it's a really dumb clearance because you could have them maybe hit a cloud and not hear part of the clearance. So these types of clearances, I don't hear them anymore. I don't know if it's something that they changed the rules on, but this is happening in the early 2000s. 
a lot of different phraseology and words and structures have changed over the years as they're always trying to improve and make things better. This is one of those that I think has probably gone away and I'm sure at some point the after landing traffic lineup and weight will also go away because I think that's a terrible clearance equally as bad as this one. Let's see what happens next. American 818, just had a maintain 3,000. Hey, 3,000, American 818. To report a near miss. The guy saw us, he, uh, uh, tower, what's your number? We need to report that when we get on the ground. And thank you, 141, did you have that MD 80 in sight like you said the whole time? Yeah, we had him in sight and uh, we were still level at 5,000 when, when he went over 141. That's focus. You're yeah, 300 feet below us, American 818. And American 818, um, I'll uh, take your information uh, when you do get on the ground. We'll just worry about that then. Okay, there's two possibilities of what happened here. First one is the obvious question is, how did these pilots see through the floor to see how close that plane was to them? That's an obvious question, right? This is a picture of how it really looks in a very busy airspace. I am the big triangle and all these little diamonds around me are other planes. And even though I'm compensating for my lack of personality by flying my big plane, these things are not to scale. It's always the big triangle is your plane and all the other diamonds are all the other planes. That's just the way they set it up. You see this plane that is behind me at the same altitude and I can see it's at the same altitude because it says zero. Compared to this one off to my left, it is a thousand feet below me or this one in front of me to the right, he is 1,400 feet above me, but the arrow down indicates that he is descending towards my altitude. That system is part of the system that we use to keep away from other planes. If the controller were to make a mistake and try to fly us into another plane, that system is part of the overall system which helps us stay away from these other aircraft while we're flying. And as you can see, everything is in hundreds of feet. So that plane was 1,400 feet above us. And my guess is that he saw 300 feet. He didn't just make up the number. He saw 300 feet, but that 300 feet, my guess would have been behind him. And here's why he came up with that. First, the pilots say we're level at 5,000. Yeah, we had him in sight and uh, we were still level at 5,000 when, when he went over. The pilots are saying they're level at 5,000 or they were when the plane passed over them and I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that that's what they were doing because I've flown airliners, I've flown corporate aircraft. So here's what I would have done in this scenario because they were cleared to 14,000 feet behind that MD-80 that was going over the top of their head. So what I would have done in that situation is I would have maintained 5,000 feet until they got over me, not started my climb until they passed over me for a few different reasons. Remember, this is what the clearance was. Thank you, 141, maintain visual separation from the MD-80, caution weight turbulence, and climb and maintain one four thousand. Now, I wouldn't have just started to climb slowly into that plane because one, it's gonna send off an alert, and that alert is gonna make the American plane go up in the air, kind of like when that Southwest plane that I talked about, when the plane flew under it, it will create that alert because you're getting into its bubble. 1,000 feet is okay, 300 feet, if you were really 300 feet, the alarm would have gone off on both planes, uh, air traffic control would have seen it. So my guess is, is they saw the 300, but they saw it behind them. What I would have done is I would have leveled off at 5,000, I would have done 250, also known as the Texas 250, and then as soon as that MD-80 would have crossed over, I, and I'm, I'm flying the Learjet, right? So as soon as that MD-80 crossed over, and assuming I have no passengers or anybody else on the plane, then what I would have done is been going really fast and then traded my altitude or my speed for altitude. And I would have just pushed that thing straight up. Well, not straight up, but up vertically very fast and gone behind that MD-80. Two things, that's not gonna alert the TCAS. They will see the 300 on there because you'll be climbing rapidly, but there's no advantage to be climbing 100 or 200 feet at a time to get right underneath the plane because that kills your speed that you're going forward and it doesn't really, it doesn't gain you anything. There's nothing fun about going up 100 feet at a time. Going up, you know, five or 6,000 feet at a time, that's kind of fun. You know, even though we're not Top Gun pilots, we, we kind of want to do the cool stuff sometimes as well. And to an airline pilot, going up 5,000 feet a minute is going to feel something like this. So my guess is that these Lear pilots did exactly what they said. The American pilots saw the 300 feet, thought they were really close, but they weren't. The Lear pilots are able to obviously see up through their windows better than the American pilots can see down through the floor, but they are seeing that code on there and they probably did change colors because as the plane gets closer to your plane, it will change colors. It will change through, uh, from white 
to yellow to red if there's going to be a conflict. So it will give you different colors and it might have changed yellow because 300 feet is pretty close. But my guess is those pilots went behind it and then just cranked it, flew up really fast behind them up to, up to their clearance, which is 14,000 feet. Which is why I say I think that this thing will end up changing because you could have a pilot make a mistake and then just shoot up and just hit another plane or get close to another plane. So they've changed this. I haven't heard this clearance in a long time, which is what you got, what this guy was told after the MD-80, you're clear to climb. No, the wait till you're clear. And sometimes it seems like a long way. There's times where I'm trying to climb up or descend and I see them and we're way past them. And I'm like, dude, let's go, come on. And then they give you the clearance. So this clearance doesn't happen anymore where you're able to, to do that. Now the closest I've got to something cool like this on a 747, we do empty takeoff sometimes. And when you do an empty takeoff, and sometimes you're required to do a full thrust takeoff for whatever reason, it could be a wind shear or uh, the engines need something done where they need you to go full thrust. There's a few different scenarios. Uh, I've seen these empty takeoffs, full thrust, and it is a wild ride. It, the thing is just rocketing up way more than 5,000 feet in a minute. Um, I think one of the best things I ever saw or that I captured and put on Instagram uh, was one of my planes, and I think we were probably empty, I don't remember what it was, but we were doing 3,700 feet a minute at flight level 300, which means we're climbing at 3,700 feet a minute at 30,000 feet, which not a lot of planes can do, but at empty 747, we have the thrust to do that. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one over here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.